Hi, and welcome to LibertyCon 33. Uh, my name is David Boop. I am the editor of several Bain anthologies, including the one we're going to talk about today, which is Gunfight at Europa Station. Thank you guys all for tuning in. Um, I have a wonderful panel here of uh, authors to talk about their stories in Gunfight on Europa Station, which is a, a space w uh, Western anthology due out this November. And uh, hey, guys, thanks for uh, joining me this fine, fine morning. How you all doing? Hi. Hey, David. Great. Coffee. Fantastic. <laughs> coffee. Thank yeah, you, it's a little hot here in Colorado. I got frozen coffee. So <laughs> it's not hot in Colorado. <laughs> No, I, I suppose compared Whoa, to New Mexico. You guys have some hot coming, don't you? Yeah. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I assure you, Colorado <laughs> don't do hot. <laughs> so let's go around the horn here and we'll have everybody introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their writing. And uh, and then we'll get into some discussion. Um, let's start uh, with uh, uh, Jane. Hi, Jane. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about you for those who don't know who you are? All right. My name is Jane Linskold. I write both science fiction and fantasy. As I mentioned, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where this morning before seven o'clock, it was already approaching 80 degrees. Uh, I am the author of over 25 published novels, over 70 published short stories, a book on writing and, uh, yeah, that'll that'll do it. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, Martin. Hi, I'm Martin Shoemaker. I am by day a programmer, which is where I make my money that pays the bills and, and feeds my cats. And by night, I'm a science fiction author, uh, mostly short fiction until about three years ago. My first novel came out from Bain today. I'm Carrie, and I've got two novels out since. I lean towards the science fiction, but I will dabble in fantasy sometimes when that's where the story takes me. All right. Uh, Mike. Yeah, my name is Michael Haspel. Uh, I write uh, science fiction and fantasy. Uh, my debut novel came out uh, three years ago now, almost four. Uh, Graveyard Shift uh, from Tor uh, about an immortal pharaoh taking on a vampire conspiracy. Um, and since then I've done a lot of short fiction and I'm doing tie-in writing, uh, for Black Library. Excellent. Ginny? Hi, I'm Ginny Koch. I write the Alien Catherine Kitty Cat series for Daw Books. Uh, book 16 is out now. Book 17 is Yes, Yes, It's Late. And, uh, <laughs> I'm doing other fun things while I'm working on it. I swear it's coming. Uh, I also write under a variety of pen names and um, include G.J. Koch, Anita Ensall, Gemma Chase, uh, A.E. Stanton, and J.C. Koch. And I write in every length and every genre. And I have a lot of stuff out there. Late, but not like Georgia or Martin late, right? Oh, I'm sadly, I'm really like approaching George and Patrick Rothfuss late without their money. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, tell us about you. Hey, I'm Patrick Swenson, and um, <clears throat> I'm writer of science fiction and fantasy. Uh, my debut novel was uh, The Ultra Thin Man from Tor five, six years ago as a sequel out. Working on a third book. I have a ghost murder story set in the Olympic Peninsula out here in Seattle, Washington area in the Olympic rainforest where I live. It's coming out this fall. I am uh, the editor and publisher of Fairwood Press, a small press that I um, run out here. I'm also the director of the Rainforest Writers Village Writers Retreat that comes out once a year. Uh, we have once a year, three sessions a year, and except for last year. And I'm a high school English teacher just finishing up. I got two more weeks, my 36th year of teaching English literature. So at the high school level. So keeps busy, keeps me busy. Excellent. Alex, bring us home. Hi, I'm Alex Schwartzman coming to you live from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, my first novel came out right before the pandemic started, which was not very convenient. It's a Redenese Crown, oh. which is an epic fantasy. Uh, and I write a lot of short fiction for various anthologies. I've been in uh, about a dozen Bane anthologies. 
Uh, I also edit uh, various anthologies, including the Capital of Cthulhu for Being, uh, yeah. and I translate uh, short fiction and novels from Russian. Cool. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so all of you have these great little side things that you're you're doing some novels and then short fiction you've got fairwood press uh you edit anthologies and so forth um what is it about having multiple things um involved in publishing you're not just focused on just like one thing and one thing only that is appealing to you and we'll start with patrick why Fairwood Press? <laughs> well, it, for me, it's it, I can go back to uh, 1995 and a little small press magazine called Tailbones that I did for 14 years. And uh, then I started Fairwood Press in the year 2000 to start doing books and um, I just kept going. But for me, both things, starting with Tailbones, it was... Um, a way to learn to learn a lot it was a learning curve um i learned what made a great story once i started reading slush um it informed my own writing um it wasn't too long after that once tailbones closed down and to give myself some more time that i sold the first novel um teaching keeps my uh, creative energy going it makes it difficult writing in the after school so summers i try to catch up a little bit um but a lot of it is just i'm learning all the time and um you know i wouldn't been able to publish that novel before 95 it, i just wasn't ready for it um but also i just like to keep busy i found out for next fall i'm gonna have be teaching all six periods next year and uh five different classes and, and i you know, like a AP literature, creative writing, an honors 10 class, a science fiction class. And they say, are you sure? And I said, give it to me. I it beats <laughs> in the same class, you know, for all periods when I get bored and all that. So um, I like to keep irons in the fire and keeps me busy and that kind of thing. So, and after I retire in about four years, I, I, these other things I'm involved in can, it's gravy on top of the, the pension. So. Excellent, excellent. Jenny, um, you write under a lot of different names, as you mentioned. Um, the story you gave us for uh, this anthology is under the uh, Anita Ensel name. Yes. Um, why, why different names? It's a controlled form of schizophrenia, and I make it work for me. Okay. Um, okay. Now, uh, well, some of it is I, I, my voice actually changes when I'm in the different pen names. Anita Ensel does not sound like Ginny Koch. If you know that it's me writing it, of course you're going to recognize writing ticks and writing rhythms, but Anita's tone is very different from Ginny's. And as Ginny Koch, I have to be science fiction's funny girl. And, you know, dying is easy, comedy is hard. So in order to not have to be funny all the time, which can be exhausting, it's nice to be able to branch out. And then I write humorously as G.J. Koch as well, um, but it's a different kind of humor from the humor I do in the Alien series. So it's just, it, it allows me more freedom uh, in a similar way to Patrick. I get to do a lot more things. I get to experiment. I get to try try new genres, which is why I get to write in all of them, because I've tried all of them and, and like them. So it's just that kind of kind of thing. I really enjoy, I don't like being told I can only be in one lane. I want to be in all the lanes going as fast or as slow as I want. And, and speaking of changing lanes, uh, Alex, you're known as is the funny guy of science mm -hmm. fiction here with, uh, with your uh, UFO series and uh, and uh, cackle of Cthulhu and stuff, but uh, you didn't give me a funny story for the anthology. And and when I asked, why, were you going to? You you said uh, no. Uh, why um, why is it that you like editing the funny stories, but you want to write more seriously? So I I have a slightly different approach from Jeannie in that uh, I write just about everything other than horror, other than straight out horror, because I just don't get it and don't really care for it. Uh, but I do write all of that under my own name. And 
I think I was pretty lucky in that I got recognized a little bit more for some of my humor writing and especially humor editing. But I also have a slight chip on my shoulder because I don't only write humor. And so if you look at my body of work, there is lots and lots of stuff that's fairly dark. There's lots and lots of stuff that's more like mythopoetic. Uh, and I really enjoy adopting these different voices and being sort of a writing chameleon. So uh, writing short fiction is a really good way to do that because I can adopt a, a completely unique voice for for a short story that I don't I can just shred that skin and never use it again if I don't want to um, and when you um, when you asked me uh, to contribute a story to this anthology I had a world in mind that I've already written in before uh, mm -hmm. and I really really wanted to go back and tell the story of that particular character and so uh, it seemed like your book you know, idea was really well suited to that specific universe and that specific story and that's what I wanted to write for you very good. All right, Jane, we're going to talk about the space whale in the room here. Uh, space Western versus space opera. All right. A lot of times people don't know there's a difference or is there indeed a difference? And I know you've written both. So why don't you kind of give us a uh, for those in the audience who maybe don't know how a space Western might be different than a space opera. Tell us a little bit about what your view going into this versus some of the space opera you've written as well. <laughs> Boy, that's a big one to get with no lead. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, I knew you could I handle write, it. <laughs> I do write space opera. Um, probably what most people would recognize as my space opera, my collaborations with David Weber, uh, the Star Kingdom books, which are far distant prequels to the Honor Harringtons. Um, I think that the line these days is that there's been a lot of association with space opera and military science fiction, whereas space opera originally was not necessarily uh, always military. A lot of the early works by Paul Anderson, um, Clifford Simak, etc., would be today classified as space opera because they're not necessarily rooted in hard science. But at the same time, uh, the, the term space opera in many cases, with a few very prominent exceptions these days, like the book Space Opera, um, uh, has often been segued over to meaning that it's going to have some military aspect or at the very least great big starships zooming around. Right. I think it's really important for the purpose of this comment to remind you that the old westerns used to be called horse operas and that uh, old westerns, if you were a big fan of old westerns, they were called horse operas and so that the term space opera actually derives directly from the already extant term for the visual Western of horse opera. And in both cases, you have larger than life themes, larger than life characters, taking on larger than life challenges. Uh, I came to Westerns via print media. I'm a huge Louis L'Amour fan, um, but one of my best friends uh, grew up in the generation when uh, the Western was still a very visible element in the theaters and turned me on to the old 1940s, 1950s uh, Western movies. And I very much enjoyed those as well. And sometimes when watching them, I can see the connection between the early science fiction space opera. You saddle up your starship instead of your... Uh, your, your horse, you head out, you're often dealing with matters of justice, uh, personal, personal identity versus community identity, and where do the two need to harmonize, etc. cetera. Uh, so there you have it. I hope I, I put on my Dr. Linskold hat properly for you there. You did an excellent job. Michael, follow up a little bit with this. Um, uh, I know you are a big, uh, uh, like Warhammer person, and I know you uh, you read um, uh, a lot of space opera as well. Um, what do you think of the 
the tropes that we find in space opera versus the tropes that we see in space westerns and uh is, is there any tropes that you think that are that are common or that clearly define them differently um yeah that's <laughs> it's also a beefy question uh and i'm gonna piggyback on what jane said about justice that seems to be uh the the overriding promise of a of a western story you know versus almost like the space opera is more is more about adventure and i think you can get away with the rule of cool in space opera more than you can in a western for at least in my mind uh, a western has to is more rooted in reality if that if that makes any kind of sense you um but uh Whereas space opera, you can almost do whatever you want. You can just, as long as it's cool, as long as it's adventurous, uh, you can do that. And then the, as far as the tropes, I think um, that obviously the fastest gun in the West uh, is is something that just keep that, that like joins both of them, right? Because you can look at the way, say, Han Solo or Malcolm Reynolds wears their uh, sidearm in a quick draw holster. You know, which is historically inaccurate to what <laughs> people actually wore in the in the Western. But again, it's like rule of cool, you know, uh, and that's an easy way to just visually or in a story tell tell the audience right away, this guy's a gunfighter. He's really good, you know. <laughs> so so he doesn't. You don't have to demonstrate it right away. You can just describe the holster, and people know what you're saying. So, uh, Martin. Um... When we look at the uh, things that inspire us and what has been has come out over the years for the space western specifically, um, it's almost a generational sort of thing, in my opinion. You have those that grew up on Star Trek, which was, you know, in a lot of ways, one of the original space westerns, and then we have this generation that's grown up on Firefly in comparison um what do you think about those two as the we'll call them the uh uh flag posts the the um uh p pivotal space westerns that influence a generation um what are your thoughts on 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 those series okay well well first to get my my biases out front I grew up on Star Trek. No A, B, C, or D, just Star Trek. <laughs> so that is sort of foundational for me. Whereas Firefly, and this is going to get me roasted, I never saw what the big deal of it was, partly because all the tropes I was told were so fresh and exciting in it were things I'd been reading all my life. So right. it was well done, but the claims of how original it was I, it just flew over my head, but I think they did it well. And I think honestly, in that term, Star Trek was more of a more, I'd almost say more of a frontier story than a Western story, that it was about the expedition. Firefly was to a large degree about the settlement. Now, yes, the actual crew were not settling down anywhere, but they were living in a world of settlements and trying to find their place in it, which to me is the more interesting Western. After I said that, hey, there's nothing I saw that original there, what they did was classic Western. The, the, going back to, to Michael and Jane's topics about justice and also community versus individual, those were huge themes in Firefly of we have to find our way of living in amongst these people in this growing frontier that's becoming more and more controlled over the years. We have to find our place and still live with ourselves by our code. To an extent, Star Trek was, yeah, it was out there on the frontier, but it was all organized and planned by this big overseeing organization. Firefly was more the lone drifter on the plains trying to find a place where he can fit in and 
make a living and not have his past come back and bite him. Right. Uh, Jenny, you had a comment? Um, a lot of times I've heard Star Trek described, the, especially the original series, as wagon train in space. And I think that supports what Ma Martin was saying. And I also wholeheartedly agree. I love Firefly. I, I was inundated with Star Trek by my family and by my husband. And I don't find it interesting. I find it boring. Um, I think it's well done. I think it's really, I think it's an important series, but it bores me. I love all the tropes in Firefly, but it is definitely, I mean, you can see it's the ranchers versus the cowboys, you know, it's the, we're going to, we don't know who that man was, but he's done save this town. There was every Western trope was really hit and hit hard. You know, the train job is, is a train robbery. Um, so I just kind of wanted to support everything Martin was saying and just say, though, that I am Team Firefly and y'all stop dissing my tiny little show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody was dissing at all. I think, the, but I mean, it, it brings the, the point of generational. We didn't have anything like Star Trek on TV for a long period of time that really captured that western feel uh stuff mm -hmm. has come and gone but since then we have had a lot of series some with success and some without um uh, uh dark matter and killjoys uh which was on sci-fi channel very much carried the torch from firefly uh where the expanse seems to be uh the love child of um uh, outland um or uh, Saturn Three and uh, Star Trek. So, um, Patrick, I think you raised your hand and you are muted. Um, I was like, I'm going back to my my um, my science fiction class I teach here, and you know, I got 18 year olds, 17, 18 year olds, and you know, I talk. Where in fact, next week we're going to be talking about the importance of science fiction and fandom as kind of a way to finish up the year. Um, and they're like Star Trek. Yeah, okay. I kind of heard of it. And and I have to tell them, like, you know, I used to have to ask my parents if I could be excused from the table from dinner early because in Montana, when I was where I lived at the time, you know, it was coming on at a certain time, but it was once a week, you know. Um, first run, the same way I would say with Star Wars, which is kind of Western East in itself, that, you know, I saw it in the theater when it came out and went right back in line and saw it a second time with my buddy and in montana we're going let's go see this movie we've heard something about it because everything's a little slow getting back to montana you know and they don't whether it's star wars star trek it seems um and a lot of the students don't even know much about science fiction and they don't know much about firefly but when i show them an episode and talk about it and talk about fandom i think fandom is part of that too that that draw you know whether you like star trek or or, or firefly or vice versa I think fandom is a big part of it because the brown coats came out of that, you know, out of Firefly, and Star Trek is, of course, you know, the poster child for for fandom, um, and a series going great guns and great guns. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I want to make I'll that. Allow point. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. No valid points. It's it's. Uh, um, and, and you want to talk about kids not knowing stuff. I also teach and tutor now as well. And I recently was tutoring a, a student who had never heard of King Arthur. Try to imagine that for a moment, that you've never heard of the story of King Arthur. Um, that just kind of like blows my mind. So then when, you know, but I, I run into kids all the time that they only know the sequel trilogy of Star Wars and have never seen either the original or the prequel trilogy. So this generational thing that happens uh, is is a th is a real thing. It, it it repeats itself where there's a thing for that generation um, that they get behind, but they maybe don't know the stuff before and they may not ever get around to seeing because there's so much stuff right now the stuff that comes after. Martin, you raised your hand. And and I want to say, in their defense, I could not name more than maybe two anime characters for the life of me. The gap is in both directions. <laughs> that there's so much new stuff coming up that I'm never going to be keeping up with. 
So I don't want them feeling like we're picking on them saying, you have no knowledge of your genre. It's the genre is so big and there are parts of it that nobody's going to know because of their experience. So I, I, I sometimes feel like we're the old gray haired farts pointing at the kids and saying, you don't know where you're coming from, but I'm as clueless as them just in different areas. Get off my genre. Uh, <laughs> Jane. I think it's great that Martin brought anime up because anime actually very often has a very strong Western vibe going through it. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the best ones as an example would be Trigun. Uh, on my list, take, no, I was going to mention Trigun. Which takes That's place great. on a frontier planet and uh, yet is very strongly science fiction. It isn't just, you know, give them uh, float, float cars instead of horses. It really is a very strongly science fiction story with uh, generation ships, clones, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. But I'm, I've been fascinated. I am an anime geek going back to when you had to explain to people what anime was, uh, you know. You can't, I, can't put that video cassette in the children's section. You need to take that out. Trust me. You'll, yeah. you'll thank me later. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I go back, I go back to when you had to, you know, most of my collection was fan subbed material because you couldn't get otherwise. Yeah. Um, and anime has a very, very strong influence um, from the Western and from the space opera. And so it's, you know, rather than shaking your stick at those kids, I think you'll find it as a transition point. And I think you'll find that one of the things that we're missing here when we talk about people not knowing what came before is it means that there's room for anthologies like the ones Dave wants to do because there is a whole audience out there who's going to be really happy and really excited to read a story like mine, which is about an asteroid miner whose husband is framed or maybe not framed. She has to find out if her husband really did kill his partner out there on their claim in the asteroid belt. And it won't be old and it won't be stale. It'll be fresh. It'll be exciting. It'll be wonderful and new. So rather than getting grumpy about the fact that there's a bunch of people out there who don't know your favorite toy, get excited by the fact that you can be part of bringing something you love to a whole new audience. So that leads uh, to a question. What was your inspiration for your story? Which I, you know, obviously I love all the stories in here. So I'm curious where, where inspiration came for yours. Mine? Yeah. I can't remember the title. Um, but it basically came from the fact that justice is a major theme and the also in classic Westerns, mistaken identity is often a big theme. So I really like the idea of taking that and bringing it up. Oh, it's called Claim Jumped. That's it. Claim Jump. So it's also a mining story, which is an, a big uh, Western theme. And Probably another inspiration is when I discovered Larry Niven when I was a college student, I promptly decided that if, if someone offered me an alternate lifestyle, I would want to be an asteroid miner. So this was an opportunity to write a single ship, small group story uh, like Larry Niven's uh, The Long Arm of Gil Hamilton or the stories where Louis Wu goes out in a single ship, you know, until he can get away. It was a chance for me to touch my inspirations and roots and yet at the same time tell a fresh new story. Uh, Ginny. Um, well, <laughs> this is actually the first time I'm announcing this anywhere. Um, Showdown on Big Rock 27 is actually part of um my belters series which nobody's like everybody's like what belters series well um way back when uh 2011 i got an opportunity to be in two die anthologies and one of them love and rockets uh i ended up writing wanted which i set in the asteroid belt and when i finished it 
I can remember telling my critique partner, I really, really, really want to do more stories in this universe. I love this universe I've created, and I really want to do more stories. And a decade passes, <laughs> you know, um, but I had an opportunity um, there. I'm in a variety of anthologies coming out this year and next year. And every one of them, I realized I could write a Belter story perf that would fit perfectly in with the theme and would fit into my um into my universe as well and the first story i was actually writing for this anthology ended up becoming a novella and i just didn't feel right saying dave could i be three times longer than <laughs> what you contracted me for uh so i finished that and i then i turned around and said okay i've got to write a story that dave can actually publish and so which i then, thank you for yes yes <laughs> uh, yes so um and then so big Rock, shut down on Big Rock 27. This is, it's a very similar, uh, it's a similar to Jane's story, but different. Um, we've got a, a family working a large, large asteroid claim, and there is a pirate armada in the belt. And they are, um, they are not nice people. And they've come onto this claim. And you're pretty much, it, it's, you know, it's like death or cake. You don't get cake. You only get death. And they are able to, they are in luck because the galactic police cruiser that's in their area that picks up the remnant, the, the, the burst of their uh, distress call, which of course the pirates make them stop. Um, they have one of the smartest cops in the belt as the, the head, head officer, and they actually figure out how to rescue the family but if they can't communicate with the eldest daughter who fortunately is also very bright the plan doesn't work so it's um it's a rescue you know rescue the kidnapped people save the claim save the town kind of thing so it was very i, I had a lot of fun writing it. i really i, I love those characters what I really liked about what your story did was it brought in the idea of like the posse sort of yes. thing. These are yes. the, um, the the spaceship that's patrolling the edge of the of this particular space felt like I was watching something like a Silverado or yes. in the way that you defined characters, which was really awesome. Yeah. Uh, Martin. All right. I I'm firmly believer believer that you don't lie to the readers in a situation like this so i'm going to tell you the honest inspiration was you asked <laughs> you asked for a story and i was happy for the chance to work with you so my first reaction is what can i do to fit david's theme do i have something because i've learned in the past if i don't have something on a theme and i agree to it nobody's happy with the results and so i said okay I like David's weird Western books that came before this one. So I'd oh, like to work with him. Do I have something on this theme? And I mean, I'm generally nuts and bolts, hard science fiction. That's not necessarily space Western, but I had just had my book, The Last Campaign, come out, which has been described by many people as having a space Western feel. And it does. I, I was well aware of the fact that, I mean, you've got a frontier city with a new sheriff who has to clean things up and has to put together a team she can rely on to help her do this. Obviously, I'm playing in a space western territory, even though that was never my goal. I can't avoid the similarities. So when David says, do you have something for this? I said, well, my book ends with the sheriff now firmly ensconced as she is the law in this territory let's let's keep the 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 concept going let's mm -hmm. send her out on an expedition with her trusted deputy to go out in pursuit of a pursuit of a fugitive so i was basically things... fitting no, go ahead. no no finish i was basically fitting the the natural growth of that story to your particular needs for this anthology one of the things i really liked about your story is the use of the elements um and great fiction makes use of every tool in the box and you use the element of the storm as as a great um 
almost a character of itself. And and that was very, very well done. Um, Mike, tell us about your story. Yeah, so uh, the penultimate stand of Pina Grocki uh, that uh, um, came from really uh, the Colorado Coldfield War that happened in, I think, 1914 and the Ludlow Massacre. So uh, historically what happened is they, they, uh, there was a big strike and they called in a bunch of gunfighters to break up the strike. So that's kind of the idea of my story is they put out a general call because they're so far out in the frontier. There's, there's really not um, big law enforcement, uh, uh, you know, organizations that can come out. So they just put out a call for, for all these essentially mercenaries and gunfighters to come down and they get told one thing. And then when they get there, they find out it's entirely different that the situation uh, they, they were essentially lied to. So, so then what do you do? You know, they need the money and, but at the same time, do you, you know, do you uh, fight these people that you were lied to about, or do you not, do you do the job you were hired for? So that's the kind of the conflict of the story. You know, and, and it's interesting, uh, you mentioned some of this uh, uh, takes place in Colorado. Both you and I are, of course, in Colorado, and there's a lot of rich Western history. But um, uh, there's, a, you know, obviously there's a story about uh, Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson, who hired on as basically mercenaries for a, a railroad war that took yeah. place here in Colorado. And I, I, I liked when I was reading your story that, you, you know, there was that kind of um, call out to real history, um, you know, in, in your story. I, it was very, very enjoyable. Uh, Alex, Thanks. tell us about your story. So uh, my story is called Winner Takes All, and it takes place in the human Commonwealth universe where uh, on the outskirts of human space, there's all sorts of weird stuff that goes on. And including in that is a bunch of planets that have dead zones, uh, which they call interdiction zones, where high technology does not work. And so the main character of my story is uh, essentially a black ops agent, a disillusioned black ops agent, because she's had a, a major op fail recently, who is charged with taking a team into one of the interdiction zones and finding a terrorist AI, which they don't even understand how an AI can survive in, in the zone where high technology doesn't work. So that's one of the reasons why her bosses are so interested. Um, and it kind of goes from there. Um, I, As I was listening to Michael earlier on the panel discuss how so many of the Western stories are about justice, it kind of clicked for me that ultimately the story does turn out to be about justice. Though I didn't quite crystallize that as I was writing it, mostly I wanted to play with um, uh, with a whole bunch of Western tropes, which are really fun, and put some of them upside down. So, so there there are some surprises in the story. Hopefully, you know, hopefully they came off well. But mostly, I just thought it was a really interesting setting to put uh, high tech characters from an advanced spacefaring society into, where they have to go into these zones and interact with uh, essentially. Uh, 19th century early 20th century level of technology and don't worry alex if it had not come across uh i would have told you in the edits uh so so you did well you did well <laughs> uh very good very good um yeah no um uh it really felt like kind of a bounty hunt like you know uh you know something we would see in a western um the idea of the bounty hunter and uh, you know, putting together a, a team of uh, experts to go into you know, you know, we we see in the old west whether it be Indian territory or you know, uh, controlled by a particular uh, railroad baron or something like that. You know, it had that feel of they're going into an area that they really shouldn't be going into, but the bounty is too good. And I really like that about your story. Thank you. Um, Patrick, you, I don't think you've told us about your story yet. Yeah, um, my story is called Seeds. And uh, it's a, about, a, I, I guess, in my, in my world, uh, it's offshoot from Earth. There's multiple colony worlds. And they were starting over. And if they said, if you want to go, you can go. You can 
take what you can throw in your suitcase and get everything else in the frontier town. Um, no technology was kind of mine, like Alex, you know, it's like not because it couldn't work, but it's just, you got to start, you start from scratch. Uh, and when we pick up the story, the man is actually, he's an older man and his wife has died. I can't remember how many years back now. And it's getting harder and harder for him to run his farm. Um, so a lot about, I guess, for aging and, and loss because he's lost his wife and he still has to try and every bend of an elbow and crick of a knee, you know, he just wonders if he's going to do something, uh, he'll be able to hang on. And, um, the, uh, the conceit is, uh, one thing I loved as a kid reading was, uh, this, a story that just always stayed with him was the John Henry story. Um, about a man coming up and working hard on the railroad and then having a newfangled device come in. So a traveling salesman comes to, uh, in his big wagon, comes to to the guy's farm and introduces this device and says, we'll have a, we'll have a race. And uh, that was kind of the gist of it. But there's a lot of imagery about um, planting and growth and loss and um, coming storm, a rainstorm and trying to finish the planting and and what, what will the guy do if he loses or dies doing it? So that was kind of the my idea. You know, and, and when I read your story, I immediately thought it it's it's up meets John Henry because you got this, this beautiful <laughs> That's true. I never thought about that. Yeah, you got this beautiful backstory of this couple leading into into where he is. Um and uh and yeah, I just enjoyed that uh immensely. Um, so for the audience, uh, in addition to these wonderful uh, authors and their stories, you're also going to get stories from Elizabeth Moon, uh, Alan Dean Foster, uh, Kat Rambo, and uh, one of her students, J.R. Martin, right together, um, uh, Alistair Mayer, and uh, Will McCarthy uh, have all contributed to this, and and, you know, everybody's i mean you can mention that asteroid mining uh in two different stories but they're so completely different just like every story of settlers going west was completely different you can and we've got everything from you know alien gunslingers and and so forth in the anthology and it's it was so just fabulous to read and I, I'm really looking forward to hearing what people think um, when this does come out in November. Um, so we we started to touch on anime a little bit. Um, and of course, anime, uh, for those of you who um, maybe don't watch a lot of it or so forth. But, um, you know, we have a crossover a lot with what we call the the samurai story and then the the western story and where you know one was influenced by the other then turned around and influenced the other and back and forth and so forth um of course you know we have also you know shakespearean uh westerns and shakespearean samurai and things of that nature um one of my favorites is being adapted into a live action series coming out soon Cowboy Bebop, which uh, is is for an entire generation, is their space western, and so forth. So um, let's just take a moment and ask uh, around the horn here: um, What, in, in your mind, what do you think is 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 your favorite space western? Whether it be fiction or anime or television or movie. Give me, like, what was the one that made you say, now that's a space western, and, and you, you loved it. Um, so, uh, Jane, we'll start with you. I already mentioned Larry Niven's Tales of Known Space, which yes. are very, uh, and that includes the short story collections and the novels that create a rich and varied frontier for lots of adventure, lots of philosophy, and some of the greatest aliens that have ever been done in science fiction, in my opinion. Um, I recently read the uh, Gil the uh, Arm Hamilton 
collection, the short story collection. Turns out my uh, uh, bio father, absolutely, that's like his favorite of all the series. And he's like, you hadn't read them? And I'm like, no. Uh, I grew up reading a lot of media tie-in science fiction, and there's still holes in my classic science fiction uh, and so I read them and I was just like, oh, my God, these are so good. So I am totally with you uh, on that one. Um, all right. So, Ginny. Uh, OK, I actually want to give a, 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 a side shout out to Voltron and Robotech, because I think those are great examples of space opera in anime. And I love both of them. Very much. Um, yeah, cross. <coughs> yeah, <Sorry. laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate Min May, though. Yeah, really can't stand oh, her. Well, yeah, she's yeah. a character everybody can love to hate. Right, so, exactly. It's translation. She doesn't I know, get- she's just <laughs> awful. Just, like, let her die, please. Um, but from a space Western standpoint, um, I really, it, it's, I've got to say Firefly for me. To me, they did a really beautiful job of space western um again i would look at star trek as space opera star wars especially a new hope really you could say was a space western but i just saw it as the greatest movie of my of my time when it came out but um i really think firefly hit firefly for me hit everything i ever wanted in a space western alex uh, for me, it's hands down the Birthright Universe by Mike Resnick, uh, which uh, encompasses something like 20 different books and uh, a lot of short stories as well. Um, I would start with the book called Birthright, which is a collection of short stories that describes the entire history of the human race from the development of space flight and until we're extinct. Uh, it's a great series, and perhaps the best endorsement that I can give it is that when I first saw F- Firefly, I was briefly convinced that it was licensed off of uh, Resnick's work. Okay. Um, Mike. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with Firefly. Uh, Cowboy Bebop is way up there, but uh, but I really, really, I love Firefly. I love Serenity, um, all, all that stuff. It just it just came together so absolutely perfectly, and I like the whole uh, like the damaged hero trope of Malcolm Reynolds, you know, the, the guy who's, who's, you know, the, the old, uh, you know, Casablanca kind of thing that I, I don't care about anybody else. I just care about myself. And, and then of course he's, he's lying to himself (laughs) and everyone else. I love that trope. So Patrick. Um, I'll have to, is is this a third, uh, for a fire, a third, third firefly? Um, I'll go back also right after Star Wars um, and another film I actually show my science fiction kids. Um, I think it I think it counts, but uh, the original Westworld um, is a great is a fun film. It you know it peters off at the end and it gets cheesy, but um, you know they're throwing every Western trope in there because you know they're and of course you get medieval world and Roman world too on the other sides, but. Um, but you know, there it's a but it's a vacation, <laughs> vacation part, and then of course robots start killing things, but killing people. So um, I love that film. I first saw it, and I still show it. And we talk about we talk about that. We talk about oh, in my in my robot unit. But uh, just real quick, did you like the reboot? And I actually did uh, the first season in particular. Um, it's it's kind of gone this way uh, the last few and. Uh, but yeah, I did. But I can't show that in school. Yeah, <laughs> any of those episodes, <laughs> HBO being what it is. Um, but the kids respond pretty well to it as well. Um, the Western saw, you know, the three times that the gunslingers, you know, after them, and you know, because they just keep putting them back together. And um, the kids are always upset that the the one character dies instead of the other because they think the other guy's wimpy. But um, <laughs> But then he has to, you know, he has to think on his feet to try and solve the problem. So, and Martin, what's your what's your favorite uh, in fiction or media or whatever? I, I'm gonna go with one that I know catches a lot of flack from a lot of critics, but it was early informative for me, which was Outland. Mm-hmm. And I, 
if I look at it today with my hard science fiction hat on, I can point out the flaws left, right, up, and down. But in terms of capturing this tone of the one person doing what's right in the face of all the opposition, I really thought it captured that, especially got right into the mood. So I, I think Outland had a huge effect on me for what I think of as the space western genre. And it is an underappreciated movie. We don't talk about it in the same way we talk about Star Wars or Firefly, but um, it is a it is definitely um, everything that a space western should be. All right, well, we got five minutes uh, left, and so I'm going to go around again and just uh, tell me something you got coming up uh, to be excited about. Alex? Um, I've been on a huge short story translation kick, so I have uh, a lots of really exciting, if you want stories from a different perspective, uh, boy, do the Russian authors are writing something completely different. And I have uh, a bunch of short stories coming up in translation in places like uh, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Tor.com, uh, and other venues. And those are probably the ones I'm most excited about because, again, it's just very different from most of the stuff that you read uh, from uh, Western and Anglophone authors. Okay. Ginny? I have um, another short story set in my Belters universe uh, coming out in the Derelict Anthology from Zombies Needs Brains, and that comes out in July. So if you want to get another another view of the Belters, please pick that up. All right. Mike? Uh, I just turned in a story for another Bane anthology called No Game for Nights that is about uh, uh, science fiction and fantasy kind of noir. Um, so it's uh, and that story is a lot of fun. Excellent. Patrick? I have this cool story coming out of this anthology called Gunfight on Europa Station. And, <laughs> well, um, I have another story coming out in August in a it's an anthology called Seasons Between Us from a Canadian press, um, which is a year delayed because they, they, they delayed it because of COVID. Um, and then my my novel of music and magic in the rainforest is called Rain Music is coming out um, in November. Excellent. Martin? Um, I've got actually stories coming out. I uh, don't know the time frame on them for three different Bane anthologies now, the Europa Station, uh, Sean Patrick Hazlitt's World, Weird World War IV. Um, I've got one coming in that, which is actually um, a, a departure for me. I, I kind of, it's a little James Bond in space, kind of. Um, and then another story for um, a different Bane anthology. I has not got a title yet, but Stephen Lawson is editing a book on AI in future battlefields, which is set with characters from my uh, Bane novel today. I am Carrie, not the main characters, but it's a character who had a significant role on that, going back to Belize and having to help deal with a rogue AI there. And then through, I don't know the publisher, but Brian Thomas Schmidt, and Bob Silverberg are doing an anthology of AI and robot stories through the history of the field with a small number of new stories. And one of my carry stories they have selected to include in that. Excellent. Jane, take us home. All right. Um, uh, I have the fourth of the Star Kingdom novels that I write with David Weber. Uh, it's turned in. I don't know the release date, but it's turned in. Um, and at the beginning of April, I sold a two book series to Bain. Uh, they're called the Overwear Duology right now, Library of the Sapphire Wind and Aurora Borealis Bridge. And they're already on the schedule for spring of 2022. Um, they're sort of I wrote them because I felt like writing them and uh, was very surprised to find a home for them because they're rather unusual. They're portal fantasy in which the characters are not teenagers. The characters are ladies of a certain age who find themselves 
summoned into a world where everyone is therianthropic, that is animal-like, animal-human combinations. And uh, the, believe me, the people who summoned them are just as startled to get them as they are to find themselves there. But they uh, decide that these three young people uh, deserve their, their help, and so they stay in this other world voluntarily. It's not a portal fantasy where the entire thrust is, oh, how do I get home again? But it's more like, oh, cool. Yeah. I'm going to go out and, uh, and explore the universe on a flying uh, sailing ship with uh, a bunch of young people with some serious problems who we all know are lying to us because young people always lie to grown-ups. And, <laughs> um, and we're going to find out what happens. And I had a terrific amount of fun writing them and can't wait to have a terrific amount of fun sharing them with other people. Um, then Weber and I have a three book contract for the Star Kingdom thing. So if he ever gets himself in order again, yes, Weber, if you're watching, I love you very much. Um, then we will we will finally get our act together and get started on the fifth book. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so very much for your time today not only your time, but your words that you gave me for this anthology that made it so special, so incredible. I am humbled and honored to not only get to publish your work, but to be here with you guys this morning to talk about it. Thank you all very much for coming. It was a pleasure to meet all of you, and I'm really sorry I didn't mute the grandfather clock. I wasn't trying to be impolite, but I have absolutely no idea how to mute Skype. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, David. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Hopefully see you at an actual con before too long here. They're back. Yay. Okay. Take all care. Right. Bye. Bye.